and we're live good evening reds good to have you on welcome to jarvis's corner and mufc realist tv uh, tonight we have a show and i will try to bring you a different perspective on things i have a um, the creator of uh, the bournemouth fan channel up the cherries in all departments craig neville coming in and we will talk about the game he will give his perspective on the game me and Stu and tom journalist one will be here and try to answer and give a lot of questions to craig so uh, stay tuned and we will be back after the intro there is nothing wrong with your television set do not attempt to adjust the picture we are controlling transmission if we wish to make it louder we will bring up the volume if we wish to make it softer we will tune it to a whisper we will control the horizontal we will control the vertical we can roll the image make it flutter we can change the focus to a soft blur or sharpen it to crystal clarity for the next hour sit quietly and we will control all that you see and hear we repeat there is nothing wrong with your television set you are about to participate in a great adventure you are about to experience the awe and mystery which reaches from the inner mind to good evening everybody this is uh, jarvis cocker on jarvis cocker's corner Tonight we have a special show, show for you guys. We are going to talk about the Man United Bournemouth game who ended in a 2-2 draw. Uh, with me tonight I have Craig and I have Stu Wally. How are you doing, Stu? Yeah, good, good, good. I had a really good weekend. The uh, mighty Tipton Town were back in action after a few uh, a few weeks layoff. And uh, victorious, uh, captains uh, yes. to victory by yours truly. So, uh, no, it was a really good game. Really enjoyed it. Um, we're uh, we're away again this week, actually uh, coming up. So uh, yeah. yeah, quite looking forward to it. Um, the women's team, of course, made the uh, FA Cup final, which is uh, terrific. Uh, for, I think it's the first time we've beaten Chelsea uh, as well. So um, is there a Emma Hayes, Jurgen Klopp, I'm leaving type of thing going on, uh, where players are down in tools for the so-called maestros? Who knows? Who knows? Great to see loads of people in a VAL room. Good to see you, Jamie. Good to see you, Neil. You've got old friend Yala. He's here, as always. Yala is always here. Yala yeah. is always here. Yeah. Who else have we got? Who else have we got today? Let's have a let's have a quick uh, quick scroll. Let's have a look. Uh, so we got Neil Driscoll as well. Ian McDonald's back. Um, let's see who else have we got. Sanjay, you see, uh, I think Sanjay, yeah, Sanjay is. yeah he's, he's quite regular, isn't he, Sanjay? Yes, is he yeah, I think the gaffer's in the background, which is ideal. So, loads, uh, loads of you in the chat already. Uh, and welcome, obviously, to our resident Bournemouth uh, supporter, uh, Craig. Uh, good to have you on board, mate. Thank you so much, Stu, and thank you for inviting me, Jarvis. It's a pleasure to be on here uh, to discuss the weekend's controversial game so to speak um we'll get back i'm sure we'll get into that yeah yeah oh, yeah, yeah. So, first of all first of all uh, craig uh, tell us a little bit about yourself uh, what you do your fan channel and, yeah, uh, and which team you support yeah no problem uh so the channel is called utc iad up the cherries in all departments um so what we do is we do a number of shows with former players um we also have some special guests that have come on um so for the uh, manchester united game we had gaz whelan from the happy mondays um in fact i've wow. already done our preview for the aston villa game um which i'm sure you're hoping that we can win that um just in case there's an outside chance um so yeah i'm sure you're hoping for that so we had richie neville from the boy band five on for that so we have okay. all these sort of guests um from where from the boy band five five yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah five. Five. if you're getting Still down don't know anything about boy band music <laughs> have you heard about new kids on the block 
<laughs> I don't know. I don't now. I know new kids on the block. Yeah, I, I do. But five. I don't. I don't recall them. Were they any good? Yeah, they had three number ones. Um, they also performed with Brian May um, and Roger Taylor mm. at the Brit Awards in 2000. So, yeah, do go and check that out after the show um, because yeah, I can live. With, I can live with Brian May de definitely. But uh, yeah, just say to him, Craig, uh, your old mate Stu wants to know if you're any good. Yeah, I shall do. Yeah, I will do. Um, but Harry's also, Harry Redknapp also comes on quite a bit as well. So, um, yeah, we're quite well known for uh, being Harry's resident YouTube channel, really. Oh, superb. Excellent. That's, that's, that sounds really interesting. You know, this is this is what I would like to do, interview a former manager or something like that try to figure out what's really going on behind the scenes because it's yeah. super interesting in a way because we see it from from one perspective from the fan perspective and uh, and the managers ex-managers ex-players have a different perspective from the inside and this is this is the interesting part and we actually had a former man united player on the show a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. and and yeah and he, that was fantastic he could tell so many stories about roy Keane and Sol, uh, oh, yeah, Solskjaer and a lot of yeah so yeah, that was a great show. So <clears throat> let's uh, just dig in and start with the show. First of all, people, if you haven't, please hit the like and uh, subscribe if you haven't and give us a retweet on uh, on Twitter. It will help out the channel. And, and then while you're at it, go and, uh, and give, uh, give Craig a like and uh, up the cherries in all departments. It sounds like a good channel. I just watched uh, half a show right now. Just to see a little bit so <laughs> what's coming <laughs> yeah um oh something happened with my screen yeah we're good we're good yeah, yeah so good. first of all uh, craig um can yeah. you tell tell us a little bit of how you saw the game the draw 2-2 two -two draw against man united so um prior to the game you know i did say that a draw would be a good result um i did think eric ten Hag was gonna um play to stop what happened at Old Trafford. What we did at Old Trafford, is like we said before, we pressed Manchester United high. Um, we caused problems at the back. Um, we was, to be honest, it's one of the best performances I've seen from our Premier League years, without a mm. shadow of a doubt, up at Old Trafford. Um, you know, a lot of people do did say, well, Man United were poor that day. I don't take that. You know, I think that we were, you know, outstanding. And I thought we had played a very, very good game. Um, the lineup was as I thought it was going to be. You know, I, there was no real big surprises. Um, you know, just the positioning of certain players was a little bit different than what I expected. Mm -hmm. um, I was surprised to see Sinistera playing, to be fair. Um, but, you know, I think. You know, in hindsight, that decision shouldn't have been made to play him. Um, of course, he did come off fairly early. But we started the game very, very well. And, of course, Solanke, a very yeah. well-taken goal. A very, very well-taken goal. Um, you know, of course, Bruno Fernandes' goal, it, it sat up perfectly for him. Sat up perfectly for him. There's absolutely no complaints. Um, defensively, it was always going to be quite difficult. And then, of course, Justin Cliver, he's got that trickery. He's got that speed. He reminds me a little bit of his father, but, you know, maybe with, you know, a bit more of an eye for goal, to be honest, um, at the moment. Oh. And I think, yeah, I think he's, I think he's really, you know, a really, really exciting player. Um, mm. Of course, he's still a youngster, an exciting player. Um, of course, plays in midfield. Um, more, you know, attacking, but I think, you know, he's... You know, he, he's coming into his own now, whereas maybe he was a little bit slower to get going. Um, and then I think it's probably best that we talk about the decisions now. Um, so, of course, there's four contentious decisions, I would say. Um, the first one is with regards to the shot just outside the box. Um, hits Harry Maguire on the top of the arm. Hand on heart, never a penalty, never a penalty. But my question here for you guys is, 
of course, Manchester United went up the other end and the ball hit Adam Smith in the same sort of place on the shoulder. So it, it hit him in literally the same sort of place. However, you know, I've seen conflicting arguments about this. I don't think it was a penalty. If Maguire's isn't a penalty, Smith's isn't a penalty. Um, some people have said, though, there is the movement, whereas Maguire stood still, you know, kind of got out of the way. Oh, yeah. There was a kind of slight movement towards the ball, and that's why the referee gave it. But I think it was extremely harsh, and VAR didn't even look at it, which, you know, was... See, this is the annoying thing with VAR for me, is why it looks at certain decisions and won't look at others. Um, you know, yeah. I've seen... I, To be honest, I did a video afterwards, after this game, and, you know, I was quite abrupt, quite furious about it. You know, let it off my chest. Bit of swearing, got to say that. But at the same time, um, you know, now on reflection... I think you can see why the referee might have given it, but still, I don't mm. think either of those were penalties. Now, there was a run-through from Ryan Christie, and this is the first one, the run-through, um, where he come, went to ground, and it was a booking for Ryan Christie. Of course, Lewis Cook got involved. He was booked as well. I think that was never a penalty, never ever a penalty, but I don't think he was trying to win it. I don't think he was trying to win it either. And I think Lewis Cook might have got the wrong idea. Um, but to book both of them was quite harsh. You know, quite harsh. I think he lost his foot mm. in the one in injury time, though. Um, personally, I think 100% that was a penalty. The action starts outside the box. And this is what um, Mark McAdam from Sky Sports, he's actually put it on Twitter or X or whatever you call it nowadays. Um, what happened is it starts outside the box. You know, there is a holding and it continues within the box. Now, under some rule, I think it's 12.3. I'll double check that. But under that rule, if that action continues into the box, that's actually a penalty. Um, and I feel that we was a little bit hard done by on that. Um, you know, I don't take this, you know, there, there's been some people say, oh, well, it's just top six bias. I don't take that. I think that's a load of rubbish, mm. but hand on heart, you know, I'd be saying the same if it was Crystal Palace or Luton or Burnley or Sheffield United. I personally think that was a penalty at the end and, you win some, you lose some. You know, yeah. we've lost out on this one. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's hard to take because I've got to be honest, you know, I, at that at that point, I thought we can do the double over Man United. This is a big achievement, you know. Um, and, yeah, it was snatched away from us. The free kick was poor to be honest i don't really get what he was trying to do he's trying to chip it over the wall yeah, yeah um yeah which he successfully did but there was no power on it so mm. yeah um that was a bit disappointing but overall i think i would have taken the taken the point before the match kicked off after it I still take the point. I still take the point. I'm happy with the point. However, as everybody knows, you know, as football fans, we always want a little bit more. And mm. really, effectively, you know, a couple of places in the Premier League, that could have been an extra 24 million for ourselves. Um, so, yeah, it's one of those. It probably doesn't do either side any yeah. good because it no. doesn't do. It doesn't help you push for the Champions League places, which is where you want to get to. Um, it doesn't help us get to, you know, on the, I've said before, you know, I don't really want Europe because I think it would stretch our side too much. Yeah. Um, but I'd like to be in contention and I'd like to finish, you know, if we can finish eighth, you know, I'd be happy with that season. 
I'd be happy with that season. And you know the financial yeah. What, what's your highest uh, highest um, position in the Premier League since you since you arrived? It is eighth. Yeah, it's eight. Yeah, so so yeah. you aiming, but you aiming for the for the highest goal tally for the season uh, yes, ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, so that's, that's pretty pretty impressive. And 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 as I mentioned, we we did a, a for for people who don't know, we did a, a preview on all for United together, you and I, and and we talked about it. And and you know, I said in that preview, I have a lot of respect for for Bournemouth mm -hmm. and how they are set up as a team. I think they look very solid. And and um, and their manager uh, Andon Andoni Iraola, you know, is he's an astute manager, tactical, and and yeah. I like how he set up his team. And he has built a, a very solid foundation of of, of this Bournemouth team at the moment so mm -hmm. uh, before the game i was i was my my uh, my prediction was a draw one one but uh, i wasn't far away from from that draw and we could easily have lost the game at the end of the at the end of the dying minutes you know when when the referee gave you guys a, a penalty uh, mm -hmm. but this is this is why i want you as a guest because i want a different perspective but i want to dig more because these episodes we all yeah. talked about them <laughs> i want to dig more into how this team was set up what uh, Andoni Iraiola did ta tactically to to neutralize Ten Hag's uh, transition play and and directness yeah. you know and and to stop our attacks uh, but before we go to that um Rosmano, the legend Rosmano, yes. the legend Oh my God! Twenty gifted memberships from uh, Rosmano. Thank you very much, Rosmano. That's fantastic, and you get to see. Mr. Uh, John Lennon in his blue glasses. Yeah, do we do? Where's your uh, Where's your old whistle? Where, where's it gone? <laughs> it's, it's broke. I don't know oh, this oh it's embarrassing! It's embarrassing. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, Rush I it I'll, I'll apologise on Jarvis's behalf. Ter <laughs> terrible, that is terrible. Thank you very much, old friend. Speak yeah. Yeah. Fantastic, Rushmano. Uh, I have to open uh, open this to read the uh, oops to read the, the new members. Give me two seconds. Sorry for the, the delay. Yes, okay, we have twenty new members, and we are starting with the Vutinator. One new member. Big up Vutinator. Thomas Svedios, Nick uh, Kandugan, Riot V, Alien Tenno, Nutshell, Ed Barrett, uh, Pig Pig Riser. Uh, Simon Davis, Richard uh, Trotsky, Johan, MFC, Matty's Corner. Oh, Matty's Corner. Oh. Uh, Sam V. George, uh, Steve Brown, Verona, Viana, Leo, uh, Weiss Leo, and mm -hmm. Farad SB, Ronan Joshi, Kevin McGee, Dwayne Blackwood. Oh, so many. ML Key, Miba Bongui, and Manchester Seven. Welcome to the club. 20 new members oh. to the MUFC Realist TV team. Remember to thank Rush Mano. Uh, before we go back to Craig uh, on the tactical part from uh, Iraiola, I'm, I'm uh, interested to hearing Stu's take on it. What did Ten Hag do in this game? How did he set up his team, and, and what did he prefer? What was his actual game plan? Because it didn't seem to work. As you would imagine, Jarvis, I saw it completely different to 90% of uh, the fan base. It was still moaning today, actually, and rightly so, because. It wasn't the best performance. I thought the game was interesting, actually. Um, I know we came out something like 57% uh, possession. And for me, I don't really care about possession. You can have 2% possession, win the game 1-0. It's an irrelevance possession. It's what you yeah. do with that possession that's the key. And um, there are times when you play a team like Bournemouth, who will rush you and rush you and rush you, who will be aggressive, who will get in your face, who will scream at you. And it kind of frightens uh, some of our players, most of our players. And, and, and Jarvis, you know this as well as I do. And Craig, if you play the game, which I'm sure you do, you'll know as well as I do. There are occasions where you've absolutely got to take the sting out of the game. I'm not saying, you know, punch your way uh, to, you know, to flatten the opposition. You take the sting out of the game of football. You get the ball and you hold it, bang. And you allow uh, somebody like Cliver to come running at you. And as soon as he comes back to you, you pop it off. Little two yard, little dink, and away. So Clivert's running around. Yeah, it's all right being pressed when you're pressing and you're winning. You don't lose energy when you're pressing and you don't win the ball. You lose energy, and that's the key to defeating teams like um, like Bournemouth. Now, I famously once said, Craig, and I got absolutely 
battered for it. And when we got beat to um, Brentford uh, last season, 4 0 at their place, yeah. I made a point that Brentford were running around like under eights. They just played eight year old football running around like cheap. And yeah. just, when you looked exactly what they did, they did nothing new. It was nothing groundbreaking. Mm-hmm. Bournemouth don't play like that, but they play similarly. So I'm not having a pop here. I'm just saying yeah. similarly with your aggression and your speed. And you can easily counteract it. It's like a, a good boxer. If you're, if you're coming at me, you're punching, you're punching, you're punching, you're punching. I'm just going to jab you quickly. Move yeah. back again. I'm going to move back. And this is what we don't do. We don't do this very well at all. And we've got the actual players to be able to do it. I'm not talking about our back four, but Casemiro, he doesn't need to run at 50 miles an hour anymore. He needs to get it. He needs to pop it off. Yeah. Great to Bruno. Just get it and just pop it off. Once you start taking the sting out of a game of football and you disrupt what you were doing, I'm not saying you didn't have a plan B or a plan C. I'm just saying once you disrupt the opposition, you then play yourself back into the game. And we yeah. didn't do that. Um, I think you're right. I think uh, we got uh, lucky to an extent with uh, with Bruno Bruno's goals, to be fair. Um, I... I I, I don't take issue with you on the penalties at all, actually. I, I, I kind of like your description. I think, you, I think you're right. I said to Jarvis, Jarvis knows me. I don't sit on the fence. People know me on here. I don't sit on the fence. I thought we got very, very lucky with our spot kick. I understand what they were talking about with the motion. I, yeah. I, I, I get it. I, I do. I understand the motion. And I think Jarvis, uh, when he was on the um, uh, review show, made a a point about the motion side of it. I get it. I understand mm-hmm. it. Uh, but I don't like handball anyway. I, I don't like that nobody knows what's handball, handball yeah. anymore. Nobody's got a clue. I don't care what anyone says. Nobody's got a clue. Whether it touches him here, whether it touches him here, whether his hand's here, whether it's here, nobody's got a clue. I just, I just don't care. Now, I'm still playing, Greg, so I know that momentum will carry my arm and there's nothing I can yeah. do about it. If I'm trying to stabilise myself, if I'm trying to position myself in a specific area, I know that my arm's going to flap around or loose or I'm going to grab somebody with it because that's just the way that it is. I kind of agree with you on both on that one. I don't think it was a penalty. Um, would I have taken it as a Manchester United fan? Absolutely. Would you have taken as a Bournemouth fan? Absolutely. But that's football. Now, I've got no issue with that. But I do like a fan of the opposition. And I do like our VAR room because they're very, very fair. Our, our, our supporters yeah. uh, and our subscribers, very, very fair. And you will find that most people would be very, very awkward about that particular penalty. Mm-hmm. What I would say about the final one with Chris, yes. I'm going to tell you something now as a defender. Mm-hmm. God, Camboale, if he'd stood up, Christie would have bounced off him. Yeah. And we would have got the free kick. As mm. stupid as that sounds. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's all about momentum. I'm not saying Camboale is a big, strong, powerful man. It's all about momentum. If he'd stood himself just slightly to the right or the yeah. left, but he, he got his back, his legs kind of spread, spread like that, Christie would have just bounced off him. And he would have done that with anyone because of the, the pace that he was going at. And then the ref goes, free kick to us because he's, he's glided into Cambola. Well, he's standing there like that going, come on, ref. I mean, he didn't do it. A little bit of inexperience. You can't argue with that. And uh, again, Jarvis, uh, you know, me, me and Jarvis are on the same page on this one. He had nowhere to go anyway, Cambola. Mm. Had zero uh, place to go. But he, it's unfair of me to criticise him. It really is, and I'm not criticising him. But I think if he thought about it, which he would have done, uh, on uh, on Sunday and today, he would have thought about what he was going to do again, and what do you do it differently this time? He would have. Yeah. You wouldn't have this contentious. And I'm with you, by the way. You, you're right. By the letter of the law, if it starts outside the penalty area, and it ends inside the yeah. penalty area, we've seen it hundreds and hundreds of times. So I just felt that Cambola at that particular time just showed a little bit of inexperience. Yeah, yeah. Was there a deserved victor in the game? This is where I see it different. I don't think there was. No. Again, I'm not going to pop at Bournemouth. Uh, I'm not. I just didn't think there was a deserved victor. I don't think you you did enough mm-hmm. when you were on top. I don't yeah. think you were clinical enough when you were on top. Mm-hmm. And I actually think um, the play you were talking about, uh, Sinestri. Sinestri. Sorry. Sinestri. 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 I thought yeah. he was terrific. 
Uh, you obviously know more about him than me. Oh, sorry. Uh, Senesi at the, in defence. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Right. Sorry. Yes. sorry. My apologies, then. No, no, no. That's all right. I, <laughs> I, yeah. was, I yeah. thought he was terrific. I, I thought he was absolutely yeah. terrific. And the problem is, and I go, I go again um, about our lack of uh, aggression, I'd have absolutely slammed him into Rose Ed. No offence. I'd have just put him into Rose Ed. Ask the question of him and see what he's got. See if he's going to answer your question. We, we don't do that. I don't know whether it's modern day football or not, but, you know, I, I, I just, I don't get it. You know, for me, it, it doesn't make sense. That's what I would do. When you've got danger, same with Cliver, quite slight. Yes. It's not it's a bad thing. Do something with him. Just, just make him answer a question that you're asking of him. Um, mm. One thing I will go with, and I think Jarvis is absolutely right, massively impressed with your gaffer. You're uh, yeah. massively imp impressed yeah. with him. Um, uh, he's, he's put together a side of workhorses that's got a lot of skill, a lot of passion. You're quite direct at times, but you do play uh, out, out from the back on occasions. I thought you were a bit more direct, uh, which is fine. I've got no issue with that uh, because you go and do what you can to win a game of football. So to sum it up, um, we didn't use our short game enough. We, we didn't use our two or three or four yard passing. I'm not talking about little poncy triangles. I'm not talking about mm. penetrate that way. I'm just talking about allowing you to run out of breath, to run out of energy for even five minutes, six minutes, seven minutes. You get as the opposition, you get a foothold in that game. And that's when our superior technical players – Again, I'm not going to go at your lines yeah. because football isn't always about technical. It's about yeah, completely agree. Um, we may well or may not have been you. And that's just the way that I saw it. Mm. Mm. Well, this knows what I'm like. I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. You, you have a great take on things, Stu, and, and I agree 100% when you when you talk because you talk so much sense uh, in a footballing way. Um, I saw a couple of comments here. Um, uh, Brendan Chapel said possession is fine if you know what to do with the ball, but there's yeah. a team that are weak on the ball and teams that are dangerous on the ball. And and I would right. say uh, I would say Bournemouth is not not a possession type of team, but they are dangerous on the ball. They know what to do. They are effective in a way. And and uh, how how uh, Irayola sets up his team, I, I like how he tries to to sometimes create overloads on the sides. How he's solid in in the central area. You have two work workhorses, as you said, Stu. In mm. in uh, who was it, Christie and uh, and Cook? They they work extremely well together. Yeah. And and you have a little bit of finesse in in Cloyvert in the midfield. Who who uh, sometimes I don't know who he reminds me of. You mentioned his his dad, but you know he's, he's more technical uh, than his dad. Yeah. And as you mentioned, yeah. he has a goal threat. So maybe if he gets some more experience, he will be he will be a, a great Premier League player in in time. But now he's too inconsistent in a way. But you see glimpses uh, of how good he can be. Uh, talking about the game, the the the, the second half, I think Bournemouth um, could have won the game, but they had um, had to do some subs and and they lost the momentum because they don't have the squad. To, to come in and, and keep up the momentum as they had in the first half when they when they did their subs and and we all saw United came more into the game in the second half but I don't give credit to Man United for that I I, I, uh, I see the explanation in in uh, Bournemouth's uh, substitutions they lost the threat going forward and you saw Maguire for example was much more comfortable in in the second half because he wasn't put under pressure that much. Well said, Dude. well spotted. You know, something else I wanted to bring up after Craig came back in, and I'm yeah. sure you would have mentioned it anyway. We we absolutely nullified and almost destroyed Solanke's presence yeah. uh, within that second half. Really astute about Cliver. I, I, I think you're right. The biggest problem you've got with Cliver is I don't think Iriola knows where to play him. I think he's probably <laughs> a better 10 than maybe a, a, a wide player, because I saw him coming from the width more. Uh, than anything, certainly uh, in the second half. I think he's a better 10 for you. To have that better 10, though, because he's a small, slight player, mm -hmm. um, you need the likes of, in my humble opinion, and it is only humble, David Brooks back in the team. I, I know he's had problems. I don't yeah. know if he's still there, but I know he's had problems. Yeah. But he's a wonderfully gifted, um, uh, very astute footballer in terms of his brain. He's one of those that plays with his brain first and his feet second. Um, whereas Clive at the moment, very, very similar, actually, 
to um, to to Wilson Ganacho uh, in terms of think with their feet first, the brain second. But you know, he's only young, isn't he, Justin Clive? Isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he is. 21. He is. I think. Yeah, yeah. twenty. Yeah, twenty-one, twenty-two. I'd have to double check that, but he is a young player. Um, mm. You know, he's not. Ooh, he's not twenty-four really, actually. Twenty-four. There we are. Yeah. Twenty-four is he? Yeah, he's been around a while though, hasn't he? Didn't he play? Didn't he start off at Ajax? Am I right in saying that? Yes, yes, he did. Uh, yes, he did. He played. Um, I believe he was in the same coaching team. As, well, he was being coached by his dad at the time. Um, mm. He's also played for Roma. Of course, that's where we got him from. Um, mm. And the thing is, is I don't think he's ever found his place. I don't think he's ever found his place. And I'm hoping that that is Bournemouth, and we can build you know, build him up from there. Um, just want to go back to your previous point, Stu, as well, about um, David Brooks. Now, David Brooks is actually out on loan at Southampton. Um, Sorry, I didn't realise that. He's actually not really getting that much game time for them. Um, there's two theories of this, because I was very, very disappointed, to be fair, when, when, we, let him, when we let him go to Saints. Because, firstly... <laughs> I think that David Brooks can do a job. You know, he showed in the game against Swansea in the cup, you know, he's still up to it. The only other thing that I'm thinking is why, why we have let him go is because of course he had Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, You know, he did have a setback last season. It looked like, you know, and I was lucky enough to actually go to the training ground. um, And sadly, it was with a good friend. Um, You know, I spoke to Steve Fletcher, who is an absolute legend at the football club. And Steve Fletcher um, managed to organise for my friend who sadly passed away, um, who had cancer. Ooh. to actually go around the stadium, meet all the players and everything. Uh, David Brooks wasn't there, but, you know, at that time, it looked as if he was just about to come back. But shortly after that, he had a little bit of a setback. So, mm. you know, he didn't play last season, um, you know. And then, you know, it, it seems like it seemed like he was getting there. You know, it's taken a long time for him to build his body back up, his muscle tissue. Um, you know, this sort of thing, unfortunately, just knocks knocks everything for six. Well, I, I can just a quickie there, Craig. Uh, I have personal experience of uh, what David went gone through. Yeah, I was 19. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, when, when, when I had it, and, and I know exactly what you're talking about in coming back, because my first game back after, well, I don't know, two years maybe, I was lucky, by the way. I didn't have any complications. I was quite lucky, you know, six to eight months of chemotherapy and, and, and that was it. After yeah. two years, I, <laughs> I remember this. I, before I went back to Saturday football, I played uh, five aside and I remember running for the ball and my legs just collapsed. Mm. Just just went, my, my whole legs just collapsed in front of me and I, I tried to style it out and I just couldn't do it. And I remember getting up thinking, fuck me, you know, Jesus, I, I'm 18 months maybe. Uh, 17 months off of chemo and I'm I just I can't I can't build myself up I can't get to where I need to be it took me another six to eight months to get any kind of strength back in my legs and uh, upper torso but once you get that once you pass that threshold you almost can tick the box and wave it goodbye very strange very strange Mm. yeah I think you know, why he has gone on loan to Saints and why he might not be getting enough game time is that he can't... He At the moment in time, you know, it's no fault of his own, he cannot cope with the intensity that Iriola and the Premier League is probably going to yeah. put on him. Mm. Um, he'll get there eventually. You know, he will get there. You know, I've got full faith in him. He's, he's a good lad. He looks after himself. Um, you know... I've met him a couple of times, um, you know, and he's always been, he's, you know, he's not one of these guys who goes out partying and, you know, doesn't do all the right, you know, he does all the right things. So he will get there eventually. Um, Mm. It's just such a shame what he's been through. And Mm. um, yeah, hopefully, fingers crossed, he'll he'll get some game time for Saints, you know, help them through the playoffs as much as, you know, 
they're our local neighbours. You know, we quite like to see them back in the Premier League because we're stuck here on our own in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so to be honest, yeah, we miss them a little bit. So, yeah, yeah. hopefully he'll help them through. And, you know, he, he's a good lad. So, yeah, mm. hopefully he's got a good career still ahead of him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Stu, Stu, uh, Neil Driscoll comes in with the uppercut. He says, Stu, I can't agree. Bournemouth should have won the game. They were the better team. Uh, in your assessments, no, no, Are Neil's you... Nick, Neil's right. Neil's got good, very, very good knowledge of football. Um, he's been watching football slightly longer than uh, than I have, um, and so that's you know I can accept uh, Neil's uh, opinion, and uh, I've got no no issues with it at all. No problem. Yeah, and on that take, we have a cherry in the chat. Matthew Harrison comes in and he said the Bournemouth were the better side, robbed as we should have had the penalty. But if you said uh, at start of the season we would have uh, had four points of united i would take it all day so about, that's my co-host the that is, happy with the results yeah the thing about that is and, and and again i've got no issues with it you know uh, no, no problem at all my <laughs> i jealous have probably not even heard my take on this i don't think you ever deserve to win a match of football a game of football you, you know you, you either win or you lose or you draw that, that, that that's it and as much as, as as players and as supporters and as coaches and as managers, we can complain about, well, we should have a penalty. You can't rely on the referee to win you a game of football. You can only rely on yourselves, the 11 that are out there at any given time. And that's the only thing I would ever say when, when somebody says to me, we deserve to win. Mm -hmm. You didn't. You didn't yeah. take your chances. And... Uh, but but that was us, you know. That was us. Have you said that though? We didn't have the chances to really take. So you know. So let, let's be clear about that. But like I said to you at the very beginning, you can have two percent possession when the game mm. one nil. And it yeah. the rest is yeah, kind of irrelevant. So. Go, going back to the game and, and, and the stats, um, after the game, it was 43% uh, possession to Bournemouth and 57 to us. But the XG was 164 to uh, 128. So Bournemouth had the bigger chances and they had 20 shots in total and we had eight shots. Uh, so in a way, I would say Bournemouth was the better team, but they didn't have enough to to win the game but they had their they had their chances and i would say we only had two shots on target uh, that game plus yeah, we, the, only had two critical, didn't we? we only had two critical shots what, what was yeah. Bournemouth's critical shot count? They, they had five okay. five but the biggest five, one five. that they didn't score was the header in the crossbar i think it was from from the left back kirkus and uh, and he had the another opportunity but they went over the header yeah. so um they could have been up uh, Two nil, two three, three one at half time uh, at least. Do you agree, Craig? Yeah, I think you know we, we actually said um, in a preview that we were both on um, before the game that we was going to get chances, and one of Manchester United's failings this season has been you know how many opportunities that you've given away. Um, you know, ninety shots against against Liverpool, you know, is a bad statistic. But that said, Manchester United haven't been beaten by Liverpool this season. So it shows that there is enough firepower moving forwards. But I'd be very, very concerned, you know, as a Manchester United fan, you know, with regards to those statistics, because, um, you know, one of the... You know, Manchester United is still, for me, the biggest club in this country. I'm not just saying that because I'm here, but they are still the biggest club in this country in terms of history, you know, in terms of what they've done in the Premier League um, and so on and so forth. I'm sure throughout the years, you probably haven't had a time like this where you are suffering so many shots. And I think part of that, has to come from not so much the defence, but also the midfield, because the defence seems to be holding it out. It seems to be that, you know, the midfield is kind of losing the position there, and that is opening yourselves up. Would mm. you agree with me on that front? Yeah, I mean, um, we, we don't press uh, at, the back, at, at the top end of the pitch, so we yeah. drop deep. So we almost drop deep to... Mm -hmm. I don't know, 
probably the halfway line at times. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and we allow the opposition to walk out. The shot thing is really interesting because I only look at it from a critical point of view. How many critical shots we can see? Yeah. And that's anywhere within the goal frame, uh, save or, or, or a goal. People always say to me, oh, you've conceded 20 shots. You know, how many are on target? That's always my question. How many are on target? Well, I don't fucking care. How many are on target? Because when, I, when I'm out there and I'm on the pitch, I'm looking at the critical side of it. Yeah. Always, always looking at the critical side of it. If somebody's pinging one from 25 yards and it goes over, whatever, mate. Not interested. Don't care. Doesn't interest me. But if somebody's pinging one from 25 yards and it's the bar, it's yeah. the post, mm -hmm. or the keeper's got to save it, then we've got we've got problems. You've got to deal with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's always it's always the critical area for me. But your point actually, and Jarvis loves this because he makes this point all the time, and, and I'm gonna let Jarvis explain it in a bit more detail. But he will talk to you about the distance between our attackers, our midfielders, and our defenders. So when Jarvis yeah. and me started first started talking, I would always talk about the yardage between our midfielders, our defenders, the yardage between our defenders and David De Gea at the time was always about 10 yards. It's a bit different with Anana, we don't have to talk about that. But Jarvis will talk to you about the yardage, 10, 15 yards, whatever it is, between attack and midfield, mm. and field and defence. And that's an area of concern for us right now. Yeah, but the thing is, it's, you have the stretch uh, horizontal and and you have it both ways, you know. It, it's, it's about being compact in, in the modern day football. Because you have to run a lot and 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 stay compact all the time. Because you know it's easier to hit, to hit a, a ten yard pass than a thirty yard pass, basically. So so it comes down to 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 simple things. Uh, going back a little bit to the game, when it comes to to the first half, I, I noticed one thing that Sulanke dropped down a lot, yes, and to receive the ball, but. He didn't try to turn with the ball and do uh, difficult things. He was always making it easy, like a bounce pass or layoff, and, and started the attack easy. And that's why Bournemouth is so effective. And for me, that was one of my biggest critics of uh, Ten Hag uh, after the game. Because for me, as a, I would say, a, a normal guy watching football, I saw it right away that Solanke was so involved in Bournemouth's build-up all the time. But we didn't do anything because he had two choices. You could either, either drop uh, Casemiro and put him on Sulanke and stop, uh, block the passing lanes, or he could be more aggressive with one of the centre back to push him up. Uh, but we did neither of the things, and and this is a big problem with with uh, me and Ten Hag because I see his in-game management as. Um, as not good enough uh, to to react to to certain things that happens on the pitch that are vital for how the outcome of the game is um but the second half Sulanke didn't have so much to to work with and i think they were a little bit aware more aware but i think also the i think he's have a slight injury Sulanke, so he wasn't as mobile in the second yeah. half he was more standing static yeah he's had a, this injury and i noticed it against the uh, in the looting game i did mention it as well in the preview um you know of course we won that game four three i think they're trying to get him to the end of the season but you know in that game it was a case he kept touching his left thigh and i thought why is he doing that? You know, it seems like there's some sort of pull or some sort of tension there. Um, mm. So the physios are doing a good job to keep him going. But the thing is, is, is that going to cause more trouble, you know, uh, moving forwards? Now, the problem we do have is without Solanke, we have got NSU now who has come in uh, from Getafe. You know, Isn't Billing a, a striker? He can play in that role, but... You know, he's better just behind. So just behind Solanke. You know, I thought he did very, very well the other day against Crystal Palace. But for some reason, you know, Iriola doesn't choose to play him all the time. But one thing I would say with Solanke is, and this is a criticism of Ten Hag. Of course, Solanke did that in the game at Old Trafford drops mm. back and he's done that all season against so many teams dropping back into a position he does the easy stuff you know yeah. he doesn't do anything dramatic which you know maybe billing you could criticize for trying to be a little bit more clever with the ball Solanke does do the easy stuff and mm. then you know he's in the right place at the right time 
Um, yeah. That's why I think he's so highly rated and why, you know, so many teams are being, you know, linked with him, really, because, mm. you know, he's, he's not... He's not flamboyant. He's not flamboyant. He's just cle- he's a clever striker. He's a clever striker, and hmm. really, I think he should get the nods for the England team. I, I just want to add, Craig, when it comes to a clever striker, because you see Hoyland yeah. in a way when he plays, he tries yes. to do the same thing. He tries to drop down, but Hoyland he's not experienced enough to do the simple things. Mm-hmm. Often, when he received the ball, he tried to wrestle with the um, with the centre back, hold on to the ball a little bit too long, and. Yeah. And and sometimes he loses the ball, but you see Solanke, he receives the ball. He's clever. Just a simple layoff, uh, simple bounce pass, and we move, pass and move. That's that's how we do it. And I would like Hoyland to to uh, take the next step in his is um, in his build-up play, trying to be more of a, a creator. It, it's an interesting um, it's an interesting subject that um, because from the centre-half position. If you're allowing Solanke to do that, you're doing it because he's he's going away from goal. So you're always thought as a centre half, he's, he's moving away from goal. He that means he's then got to turn. So if he's moved out five yards, he's got to turn. He's got to gain that five yards, and you're already in position. Okay, that's yeah. fine. But as you say, he's quite clever. So you kind of as a centre half, you kind of want to tug his shirt a little bit. You kind of want to drop the elbow down his spine a little bit, make him turn around. And, what are you doing? And uh, Kind of dislodges confidence in, in 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 many ways. Doesn't always work because sometimes they'll be expecting it. But what you can achieve by doing that, Jarvis, is getting him to back into you, get him mm. to wrap his arm around you. And once you've got that contact with the centre forward, mm. then you've got something tangible you can work with. You've got something you can deal with uh, because you know exactly where he's going to be. And he's not going to roll you if he's got his arm around you here. He's not going to roll you left or right. Mm. So this is where yeah, and I, I look. I hadn't seen this with Solanke before. I've seen uh, very, very similar to what Hoyland does. Try and fight Hoyland or, or, or back in. He doesn't actually back in correctly, Hoyland, because what he does, he backs in with both his legs together instead of backing in with his yeah. with, with his, his his arms and his two legs spread slightly. So if you back in, you got your two legs spread. You kind of arch in your body. You become difficult to get around. You you're wider. So then the defender's got to tug you and drag you, and and I'd like to see him do that. So Lanky doesn't need to do that because Jarvis has picked up as well. Really, really nice, really easy, really fluid. I'm going to take two steps off you. Maguire's going to look around. Well, there's nobody behind me, so I ain't going to get done for pace because I can drop back two, three yards. So I'm not going to get done for pace. And he's hoping and praying in a way that the midfield will come and help out. As Jarvis said and Jarvis talks again about the difference and the gap between in the field and so Solanke saw it dropped in five six yards yeah. there's nobody around me I'll pop it off to whoever and yeah. I'll, I'll amble uh, you know into the box and that's mm. if we could get Hoyland to do that and he will eventually I mean yeah. he, he will get there and yeah, we, he, we see him do him do it sometimes you know it's not that he's not doing it at all you know but but not, consistently yeah, not. Um, but the interesting thing is, we talk about in-game management, you know, and, and Jarvis is right to an extent, but he shouldn't need telling. Yeah. You know, a, a man like uh, Maguire or a man like Martinez, a man like Varane, they shouldn't need telling. Camboala, to an extent, yes, but these players shouldn't need telling. If you're going to let him drift, okay, don't let him outside your, your zone. Don't let him outside that square. Yeah. Mark out a square within your brain and don't let him outside of there because if you do, he's going to cause you a bit more trouble on movement. Hmm. Um, I think a lot of people were saying they're trying to blame Maguire for the first uh, goal. He didn't come across. Well, he, he wouldn't have known what to do really uh, because he wouldn't have been expecting the uh, Camboala slip for a yeah. start uh, due to your overly watered pitch on my dad. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I would think, I would think shit of that nature since the late 90s. It was terrific to watch. Absolutely terrific. Do you and know like, what? It, it's something that has been, you know, and a couple of Bournemouth fans have even said that it's it's gone against us. Um, there was a uh, Solanke penalty 
against, I think it was Sheffield United, if I'm re- remembering correctly. Yeah, it was Sheffield United. Um, and Solanke's got the penalty. And he's just slipped. And he's gone skywards. Um, yeah. And that is because, you know, I do feel, yeah, there is a point that I think that one half of the pitch is watered a little bit differently. But Absolutely. I guess... <laughs> when we surprised you like that, Craig. Look, yeah. we, we didn't wear the right footwear. Okay. Yeah. We can put the right footwear on, you know. Cambuola went down, uh, a couple of players went down. We just didn't wear the right, footwear. yeah. And that really is part of the coaching department. Our coaches should have gone on that pitch, taken the Copa Mundials and taken the World Cups and made a decision on what they need. We've gone back in there and said, Fellas, we've got to be in studs this side. It's going to be a pain for you, uh, the opposition side. It's going to be a little bit harder, but you need studs here because you're going to lose your footing. Yeah, you can't wear all weather, you can't wear multi grand. You can't wear any of those because there's so many different uh, types of studs right now. Yes. You've got to wear six shooters. Six shooters, we'd have been fine. We'd have been hard yep. on the feet, your side, but we'd have been fine our side. Kabbalah probably wouldn't have slipped. But again, yeah, I'm old school, Craig. I go back years, mate. You know, and uh, yeah, I, I like stuff like that. I don't have an issue with it. So I'm not criticising because I just I love stuff like that. I do. It's brilliant. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I just want to add Ed Rosmano's comment before we move on. It's just, Kane, Kane is a master of that too. You know that. The, yes. Yeah. He is. He yeah. Is. And, he is. and he should be watching his, his free kick fouls against him. And and Kane, yeah, he, he's a master, but he comes with experience. Kane wasn't like this when he was 20 years old or 21 years old as as Hoylund is. He developed as a striker and he has developed this game immensely the last. Seven eight years in the Premier well, League. All, all, all Solanke's got to do, Jarvis, is uh, move forward to two yards, drag the defender in, and stand still and wait for Maguire to, you know, <laughs> to, to <laughs> bow. Cheers, mate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> you know. The thing is, with all that, with, with the pitch being watered, you know, it's it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of a hidden shit house, three, like you say, that you know we were used to. In the 90s, early 90s, Wimbledon was the best one for it, weren't they? They were doing all sorts to cause trouble. But, yeah. But, you know, going back to Solanke, um, you know, I think he's an out-and-out striker. Um, You know, I think he's a fantastic, you know, all-round striker, I should say. Um, Mm. You know, he drops back. And that's why last season... and. I think he matured a lot under Gary O'Neill. And, of course, now Iriola's giving him an extra spin to it. I think, you know, he's even more effective, you know, especially with scoring the goals, but also creating things for others. Last season, you know, he probably didn't score as many as, you know, we would have probably have liked. However, what he did do was he created stuff for... Jefferson Lerma or Philip Billin. Mm. Philip Billin's quite an interesting one. And I think this might be actually forming with Justin Cliver. So what happens is when Solanke drops back deep, you know, you've, you've got the outlets like Christie. Um, of course, last year we had Lerma. Um, you've got it, all these yeah. players dotted around. Semenyo's a good one. You know, he, he works very, very well with Solanke. But what will happen, Solanke drops back and then Billy will push forward a little bit, or Clive will push forwards a little bit, and therefore you've got that kind of switch. Um, and I think it's worked very, very effectively. Um, one thing, you know, like I did, I did say, you know, we used to play at the start of the season, we were playing very much possession based football pass, 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 um, and maybe. Like you said, Stu, that that could have well been the way to suffocate Bournemouth, you know, to control the game. Whereas what we were doing was we was controlling games, you know, to an extent. That game at Everton at Goodison Park, we controlled for large periods of the game. It's just because we made stupid mistakes at the back. Whereas this, after the Burnley game and what you saw you know, implemented so well, so quickly at Old Trafford was this press from the front. So I don't know if you remember, you know, it was, it was our um, kickoff and it went straight in to the top, uh, top right hand corner of, you know, the, none of the Bournemouth players were there, but of course, then you've got to come back at us 
and already some of our players, you've got Solanke, you've got Christie, they're already pushing, you know, forwards to put pressure on the Man- Manchester United defence from kickoff. That doesn't always work. We did try that against Brighton and it failed miserably. You know, 16 seconds from kickoff, we conceded our own kickoff. How you do that, I don't know. But um, <laughs> but I think Iriola was still implementing, you know, his game plan at that time. And I think he's yeah. got it to a T now. Um, but I think Ten Hag did... He did react to it a little bit better than he did at Old Trafford. But still... You know, controlling things in midfield, suffocating us. You know, let's be fair. You know, I, I'm I'm not going to turn around and say we've got better players than Manchester United because I don't think we do. Mm. You know, I think we've got, you know, hard-working, effective players. You know, I think mm. there is probably some Manchester United players that whoever is in charge, um, be that Ten Hag or whoever, um, you know, will need to be shipped out the door. You know, I think yeah. as much as I like Marcus Rashford, you know, as a person, and he is a good, good person, what he did during lockdown. And, you know, I've got so much time for him. Unfortunately, he's not, he's not working in this style that mm. Ten Hag is implemented. Now, does, do you wait for a new manager? See what, you know, you can get from him? Do you send him out on loan to someone like ourselves who, you know, might be able to get his love for the game back? You know, he might be mm. able to play our style and then take him back and, you know, hope that he might be able to, you know, work within the Manchester United side because there's still a good player in there. Yeah. It's true. Before, we go, before you go to the comment on, on Rashford, uh, I just want to bring up one thing. I see the VR yeah. room talk a little bit about mistakes. And I have a oh, great yes. comment here coming from uh, Brendan Chapel. Um, maybe you can read it out, Stu, on your perfect British English. Yeah. Yeah. He said uh, mistakes mostly lead to uh, team scoring goals. Uh, that's the big aspect of football. That's why Cruyff said football is the sum of mistakes. It's true. So the team that makes the least mistakes wins matches. It's absolutely, it is. It's true. Uh, you know, any, any player that you ever talk to who's made an error, it's how they get over making that error, which is the key to uh, either getting back into the game or losing the game. And that's that's basically what happens. If you, if you commit an error in the key areas, uh, the critical areas on the pitch, uh, and you can't recover because you're mentally not strong enough to do it, uh, yeah, your, your team is going to lose the game. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Just quickly on Rashford. Yeah, I, and I just want to add in your comment before we move on on Rashford, too, because yeah, I, I, had, I had a talking point on Rashford later, but we can do it right now. Sure. Uh, but when it comes to, to mistakes, I just want to say uh, the opposition will always make you make mistake you know they will force you in a way to make mistake and in this game particularly you had the left back uh, Kirkes. he was wide and in the attack and he forced Dallow to make a move and 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 move up out and and it, and it created an opening between Dallow and Kwambala and right. that, that opening Kloivert, uh, Kloivert saw and and you know it, it was a mistake but Bournemouth forced us to do that mistake by their system and how they set up so we can we can blame players but we got to remember it's it's also a tactical game it's a chess game how you put your pieces and and you have openings because you put your pieces that way and at least that's how i see football so now i said it Stu, go to rashford yeah all i was going to say was it was just really a point that uh, you picked up rashford there's two types of arrogance in football uh, there's arrogance that allow you, like Eric Cantona, uh, to walk into a room, stick yeah. your fingers up to anybody you like, and go out there and perform. And there's a second type of arrogance which thinks, you, well, you know, I've already made it. And that arrogance completely shrouds what it was that made you the player, what it was that made you understand and want to love football. Because yeah. when you look at Rashford in particular, people don't care about the past, they only talk about the present. What, what you talk about during COVID, that's gone now. Nobody speaks about that in our, in our fan base. Nobody speaks about it in the press. Nobody speaks about it at all. Football's all about the here and now. And this arrogance that you've already made it is the mother of all fuck-ups in football. It, it really is. And we've got too many of these types of players that have come through our club just recently 
happen actually over the last uh, 10 years that won't allow them to kick on rashford should have been at uh well real madrid should have been coming and knocking on our door yeah. uh, regularly for somebody like rashford because he does have a talent he just refuses to use it um mm. i don't know whether going to uh psg you might get 40 million for him now who knows it uh, would be would be warranted uh you've got a similar issue with lingard for example another one who thinks he's you know he thought he made it and he was too arrogant but it was mm. the wrong type of arrogance uh and it's not working for right himself so what you need is uh for him and the people around him uh to kind of you know wind his neck in a little bit and and, and try and reevaluate what they want from the game he's best off right now rashford retiring completely yeah. just just retiring from the game because he's no use to anybody he's no he's not even a use to himself you know mm. when when he gets up in the morning he jumps into his Merc or he jumps into his whatever car he's driving he drives the training ground and he he's got his poncy little wash bag with him like they all have nowadays mm. they walk in with their louis vuitton this and their gucci that they get to the dressing room, all their kits laid out for them. They don't know what life's about, you know. And when you hear about, oh, ten hogs lost the dressing room, ten hogs shouldn't be doing this, ten hogs shouldn't be doing, fuck them. You're grown men. If you can't take criticism, public criticism, then you're in the wrong game. You want all this adulation. You love the public adulation you're getting. Well, unfortunately, it comes for both. So people like you know somebody like rashford sancho sancho's another one i mean crikey uh martial you know all these types of players that you, you know they should really if i was them if i was in their shoes i'd be embarrassed really yeah. to get up in the morning and go to training i'd be embarrassed because they're not they're clearly not working they clearly can't be bothered and ten hog is you know it, in my opinion, does the right thing by calling these players out, uh, and whether uh, fans like it or not, uh, it's just my opinion. And I think it's 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 right when you're a professional footballer, as Lucky Singh says, you take the rough with the smooth. You absolutely take mm-hmm. the rough with the smooth, and we aren't doing that. When you look at the players that you've got, yeah, only 25, 30, 40, maybe fifty grand a week, then it's different because they're, they're playing for everything. They're playing for pride. They're playing for the families, they're playing for the club, they're playing for the fans. And somebody like Solanke, sorry to say this, I think I'll be at Aston Villa next year, by the way, because uh, I think Watkins is going to move. And I think yeah. Solanke is perfect for yeah. Villa. He'll be the perfect foil for Villa. He really will. Um, he would avert that move, though. And I would yeah. imagine that his fans, you'd think, you know what? Fair play to him. He's been here for what, two, three, four seasons, and he's given us all for those four seasons, three seasons, however long he's been with you, you go with our blessing. Rashford, fucking hell, that'd be a fucking parade for when he goes because mm. we're not, we, we just haven't got this. We just don't have the mentality anymore to want to win because individually we've got players that can compete and can play when they want to play. Mm. And that's, you know, the, the, it's, it's all about, and I say this all the time, by the way, and I, you know, I have, um, you know, people don't like it when I say it, but you're the only one that can determine what happens on the football pitch. You can have all the coaching in the world if players are coached nowadays, which we know they're not. Uh, in fact, I think uh, Eric Dyer came out and said that Poster Cogley doesn't bother coaching. Mm. Uh, Sir Alex Ferguson didn't bother coaching. He, he demands and he trusts players yeah. know what to do when they're out there, which is absolutely right. Um, and so if you have a player in your dressing room that needs motivating, fuck him off. Yeah. Because yeah. nobody should need motivating. Nobody. Jarvis said, walk to Old Trafford tomorrow. Do it for free. You do it for Bournemouth. You do it for free. You don't need that motivation. And um, unfortunately, player power today, um, unless until somebody absolutely puts a hammer and nail in a coffin on it, it's just going to get worse. And we, as a club, and Manchester United now need to do that. To be honest, actually, that all makes perfect sense. You know, cast our minds back to when Eddie Howe was in charge of this team. Now, of course, the story goes, we was on minus 17, League 2. You know, we were, you know, 
in the ship, put nicely. Um, we had bailiffs at the door. You know, we were signing players on free, signing players on loan. Um, we bought back Steve Fletcher, who is an absolute legend. But one thing with Eddie Howe is, and this was the core thing from when I've met him, when I've met people around him as well, is that Eddie Howe had a type of player. And that player had to be a uber professional they had to be dedicated to the cause somebody mm. like mark pew who was signed from hereford united for literally peanuts um you know i love to use harry arter as an example but of course he did go a little bit off the boil towards the end of his time here. Harry arter, he did didn't he yeah. yeah yeah but when you look at the majority of that team you know that you know through eddie howe's time that team was uber professional, dedicated to the cause. There was people that did let him down. And unfortunately, one of those players, um, Ryan Fraser, you know, basically, A, well, was an absolute disgrace during the COVID yeah. period, you know, refused to sign an extension because he thought that he was going to get a move to Arsenal. That was yeah. all. That yeah. He was going to get his move to Arsenal. You know, it didn't happen in the end. He went to Newcastle and then, of course, Eddie turned up there. Um, where Eddie, you know, from when I've met him, he gives people, you know, he gave players second, third, fourth chances. Oh, he gave Jordan Ibe about 10 chances. But he yeah. knew when enough was enough. And those players, the, the, the majority of the players that he had would be uber dedicated. And when he was signing players, that was, you know, the key attribute. You might have failings, but if you are going to run through walls for this football club, then you're a player that I do want. I think that went a little bit downhill with Scott Parker. Um, but Gary O'Neill and, of course, now um, Andoni Iriola, yeah, I think yeah, yeah. they've both got that back. Um, Iriola is, of course, a Basque manager like Unai Emery, um, Zabi Alonso, Mikel Arteta. And I think they ask for, there's a reason, you know, and without going too much into it, there's a reason why Aaron Ramsdale has basically been dropped by Arteta because the mm. professionalism seems to have dropped a bit. You know, I like Aaron, but I think, you know, maybe his professionalism has dropped a little bit. Maybe he has got a little bit above his station. So he's dropped him, you know, and I think that's fair enough. And I think the Basque way and the Basque style of management is just like that. That's why Aston Villa are doing yeah. so well. That's why Aston Villa are doing so well under Unai Emre, rather than Steven Gerrard, because it's a focused approach and it's, you know, a dedicated approach. And you don't have these players like Marcus Rashford, you know, Sancho. Those players should be able to walk into any team in this division. Mm. But they, they've let themselves down. And unfortunately, Rashford has let Manchester United down. Does he go out on loan? you know, to see, you know, if he can pick something back up, you know, even if it's to the championship, he might not like it for a while, but it might make him realise, do you know what? I've got it bloody good at Manchester United. I'm playing for easily the biggest club in England. You know, I need to make a go at this or otherwise my career is in tatters. Yeah, the thing about uh, Rashford is uh, he'll never go on loan to the championship. Um, we, we may as well sell him uh, and, and, yeah. and get our PSR sorted. Him and McTominay would sort our of PSR like that. If we've got a yeah. PSR, we don't really know. Um, there's a couple of things that our fan base is hugely divided on whether or not Ten Hag should stay or should go. Uh, me and Jarvis have been a supporter of Ten Hag uh, to this yeah. day. Jarvis is kind of losing patience with him, which I, I get his reasoning behind it. I'm still okay. As much as I just don't see the point, oh, I don't see the point. Yeah. But one thing me and Jarvis have never been able to fathom, um, and we were speaking about this today, and that is, I've asked over the last couple of weeks, if you get rid of um, Eric Tenor, who are you going to bring in? 
and you could give me any name. You could give me any name, Irola, yeah. for example, whatever. Uh, and but I don't want to hear it because of his style of play. I'm not interested in that. I want to hear what he's going to bring to the club that Eric yeah. Van Hag doesn't bring to the club, and that's the key element to a manager. It's not all about style of play, because and Jarvis, no, you know, job. By the way, me, I still play uh, for a veterans team. Jarvis uh, played at good level in Norway uh, when he was coming through, but he no longer plays. But so it's we a long time ago, long time ago. Yeah, but we understand the game. Inside, yeah. like, as, as I'm hope you've you've got yes, yeah. understanding of, um, and we know as well as as well as anybody, the style of play is just a phrase. It's just a catchphrase. It's yeah. a book phrase. It's whatever. Because when you cross that white line, you get into a hamster wheel, okay. And whatever you've learned on a Tuesday and a Thursday in the semi-pro world, or a Monday Tuesday, whatever you've spoken about, the game evolves, and by two, three, four minutes, it's a different game of football. Completely yeah. different game of football, and your point in 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 uh, when you conceded against Brighton for the first sixteen seconds, I can't yeah. imagine anyone was expecting a from the kickoff a long ball forward for the defender just to knock it down to the uh, right winger, which I'm guessing's yeah. happened, and they've yeah, yeah. they quick through like an knife through and they've scored. So, so hold on, that we didn't do that in training. That, that didn't happen in training when we played right. on eleven. So what do you do? You don't all look to the gaffer and go, what do we do? You get on with it. You use your yeah, breath. Exactly. You settle down, you get on with it, and you then you make your attempt to play your way through the game. Get to half time and then you regroup. Mm-hmm. Gaffer gives you a bollock in for the first 16 seconds or two minutes or whatever. You know, we were set up better than this, blah, 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 blah. Right, this is what we're going to do because this is what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And I bet you now, I bet you on 90%. Ninety-five percent. What you speak about at half time bears no resemblance to what you were talking about <laughs> during the week to that game, because yeah. nothing, nothing ever bears. It just doesn't happen, and that's why I call it hamster wheel. You get on that wheel, and then it just keeps turning and turning. The game evolves and it evolves. And Harry yeah. Arthur always plays the ball with his left foot. Well, hold on, he started playing it with his right foot. I hold on the gaffer didn't tell me that. Fucking hell, gaffer brains this is why i can't get with a style of play because i can't get on board with it i just can't get on board with it so what else is he going to bring what what else is he going to bring and gary yep. o'neill mm-hmm. look at what gary o'neill did gary o'neill brought something completely different he brought an attitude and an attitude if you're not here to fucking win fuck off mm-hmm. and i don't yeah. know about him and i'll be nice i'll be gentlemanly about it and we're going to work together. And we're going to talk everything through, and 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 that's how I look at it. You know, you know, Scott Parker when he was in that Liverpool game, you know, he was very much, and afterwards he was very much blaming the owner Maxim Dome, who supported this club all the way through the leagues. You know, it was all finger pointing blame. You know what Gary O'Neill did was he completely changed us. He completely modified what we was doing, you know, because if we had consistently, you know, under Scott Parker, we sat back too deep, you know, in that Liverpool 9-0 thrashing that we had, sat back too deep, and they were just picking us off at ease, pass, 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 oh, there's another one in the back of the net, it was easy. What Gary O'Neill did was, it was a board draw, to be perfectly honest, it was a nil-nil draw against Wolves, but it was probably one of the most vital results that we could have got it was a clean sheet you know it was drilled that right this is what we're going to do be a bit tougher and he evolved you know he didn't always get it right he's still learning as manager um you know like Iriola you know if Iriola had consistent persisted with what he did against Everton and he probably did persist with it a little bit too long. That's why I did question, well, is he the right man? Is, you know, what he's trying to do going to work in the Premier League? He evolved and therefore, you know, become the manager that he is now. Whereas, you know, and I can give a good example, um, Brendan Rogers, for example. Brendan Rogers is a really good one with Leicester City. Has taken over a good side on the up, 
you know, a decent, decent side. You know, he's ran with that for a little while and that's worked. But as soon as things started going wrong, this is something I've always said with, about Brendan Rodgers. As soon as things started going wrong, and he did the same. If you look back at Brendan Rodgers' career, he did the same at Liverpool. And one of the ones that, you know, looking back some time ago was Reading. When he was there, mm-hmm. you know, they were in they were in a complete and utter mess. Steve Copper had left the club. A lot of players had moved out. He didn't know what to do. And as soon as he didn't know what to do, he couldn't change it up. He just persisted with what wasn't working. Mm-hmm. So if Ten Hag is getting into that p- path where he's just persisting and persisting and persisting and persisting, then it might be time to make a change. But who do you replace him with? I completely agree, Stu. You have to find somebody who is going to bring a new impetus. The results aren't probably going to change overnight, but somebody who can adapt things, somebody who can look at the Manchester United team and go, right, we need strength here. We need to get move these players on. You know, I think, prob- you know, I'm of the view you know, looking from mm. the outside in, that Manchester United should be competing for the title still. You know, yeah. I think you should be competing for the title. Yeah, no, well, look, um, uh, the reason me and Jarvis do this show is we we, we, we have uh, a very similar outlook on the game. Yeah. Uh, we have differing views on how we get there, but ultimately we get, we get the right... Um, the right uh, way, because that's that's how we see football. The interesting thing is, though, for me, it's always a failure if you don't win that league. I don't care. If, if you finish second, it's a failure. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, it's a complete failure. It really is. You, you are out there to win that league. People say, well, you know, um, and, and I always say this, famously, I always say this, Jarvis yeah. last time I say it, uh, well, we won the first game, we're in a title race, because we are. We're in a title race. We've won yeah. one game in, we've won, we're in a title race. And we keep and we're always in a title race, title race, title race, title race, until you can't be there. You can't be there anymore. We're in a title race. I don't like finishing second. I'm a fucking terrible winner and a really bad loser. Yeah. Manchester United have no terrible winners. You know, when you go in that dressing room, uh, uh, Chelsea have just beaten um, Everton 6-0. Uh, yeah. All right, and they might have hit the post twice. So when we're going in there, great six no win. Yeah, but you at the fucking post on two yards could have been seven, could have been eight. Yeah. That's that's how I am. That's how we are. That's how you yeah. should. Be. You shouldn't just take six nil. Why didn't we win eight nil? Why didn't we win nine nil? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Break Premier League record. Why didn't we break that Premier League record? If you'd fucking scored those two, we'd have been on eight. We'd have got two goals to break the Premier League record. Ten nil, yeah. Chelsea. 10, 10 nil. Not brilliant for the opposition, I know, but, but, but 10 nil. Here's the thing. I just, I'm just, I'm sorry, Mark, just one quick one. What you spoke about, uh, the 9 nil defeat. Yeah. The question shouldn't be what should Scott Parker do about it. My question is what the player is going to do about it. How you, If you're yeah. going in and you're 5 nil down at half time, I've got one question for the team, and that's it. How are you lot going to get yourselves out of this hole? Mm. What are you going to do? Yeah. Mm-hmm. To get out of that hole, hundred percent. All the emphasis on them, and then it's up to the three or four or five players, the captains, and then around the team to get the players together. And say, you know what? We ain't conceding this. Are stuff it. We're not going to win this game. We know it. Okay, we yeah. ain't conceding. That's it. Enough. Shut up, shop. And then you go out and you get beat four, you know, by four nil again. Well, yeah. it's else to blame. So anyway, sorry, Mark. Uh, I uh, I apologise. Yeah, we're just going to big, big up uh, Mark for being a member for seven months. So, magic number seven. Big up Mark. Um, Love you, Dave. I, I just want to add, uh, you, you have a very interesting um, um, discussion now. And, and when it comes to motivation, yeah, it's on the players. We have already seen Man United perform as we did against Liverpool. We have had great games against Aston Villa, Chelsea at home. So we have seen snippets. So we know it's, in a way, it's it's not the, the level of the players. They can go there if they want to. We saw it. Yeah. There's no way to hide after that yeah. Liverpool win. And Absolutely. now we see them drop down again and again. They drop down against Brentford. And in a way, 
no disrespect, they dropped down against uh, Bournemouth. And and the thing is, as you said, we have better players. Why can't they perform every week, week in, week out, and give the, them all, give the all, and, and, and try at their best abilities? Players like Rashford is... It's, um, it's a conundrum in a way we, we can't understand. And everybody tried to point out stuff like, for example, Rashford um, is, isn't bothered. He, he looks, uh, he looks uh, not motivated and stuff like that. But for me, I think it's more up to, to the style of play. I'm, I'm always on the style of play. And, and Stu, this will where me and Stu uh, disagree sometimes. Um now the transitional style, I think it's it's not uh, Rashford's uh, best uh, attribute. He he's not good at pressing. He's not good at working, tracking back, and and now he's exposed in a way. And you you see he he's not thriving in in the ten hog system, and and that's a big problem. He can be as motivated as he wants, but you know he can't track back. He don't know how to press. It's not his his style. He's not a hard working grafting forward striker yeah. he's more of a, of a luxury player and he's good at, he's, he, he's fantastic at pace and find the space and run into it and and shoot that's rashford um so Bob agrees with you. that's exactly what he was talking about if i can find his um his tweet his, his message to me he kind of agrees with you there jarvis yeah uh if i can find it again sorry i did put it up um but anyway he, he was yeah. roughly saying uh, that we don't have a clue on the pitch. And, and I don't disagree with that. You know, I don't disagree. We don't have a clue on the pitch. And I, I, I totally agree with you. It's not Rashford's game, etc. But this is where this is where me and Jarvis do disagree a little bit because I think, well, you know what? If it isn't my game, I've got to learn how to play that game. I've got to learn it. I'm not, yeah. you know, I'm not going to rely on other people. I'm the one who's got to learn it. You see, I always say... Um, with today's day and age, there's absolutely zero excuse. Okay, when I first started watching Man United back in the 70s, 1977, um, if you if you had a black and white TV on the sideline, it'd be an absolute miracle. Today, Harry Maguire, if he's up against Dominic Solanke, say for example, and Jarvis eloquently put how Solanke plays, so did you, Craig? Yeah. But you're, if I'm Harry Maguire, I'm walking in Monday morning, right, no, Saturday evening, I'm likely to be playing, I'm likely to be playing Solanke. So I'm going to do me training, Monday, Tuesday, come Wednesday, uh, after lunch, if I'm not doing any gym work, I'm in the anal analytic room, okay? And I'm right, show me the last 10 games of Solanke. I want to see his movement from the halfway line to the goal line. I want to see that movement. I want to see everything. Show me all his movement. And then I'm going to try and work out. So when the ball comes to me, does he take it with his left foot or his right foot? Does he chest it five times in a game or once a game? Does he have yeah. a good a flick on or a backward flick? And I'm I'm trying to look at everything. Jarvis mentioned about him is in taking two steps forward. Does he do it to the left, to the right, or centre? Mm -hmm. Does he spin in behind me? And if he does, which way does he spin, right or left? I want to be armed with everything, every little bit of knowledge. If I flick his ear, is he going to cry? You know, that type of thing. But you can do all this. Harry Maguire could spend half a day, half an afternoon looking at it, taking the tapes home, looking at Solanke, getting inside Solanke's head. So when he comes and he takes that pitch on a Saturday evening, that it was, Dominic Solanke, here's my pockets on joint. I'll put you in there now because I know what you're going to do, pal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Why yeah. Why can't they do that? Why can't they do that? It's not rocket science, is it? No, no, it's not. It's not. And, and you have a great point there, Stu. And people in the in the chat room now really, really fired. But first, we got to take uh, this uh, new membership from Grace uh, Sheridan. Yeah, Thank you. A new member. Welcome to the club, uh, yeah. MUFC Realist TV. Thank you, Grace Sheridan. And um, being a new member, I just want to add added some um, comments there. Trevor, Trevor Wade comes in and says, uh, what is the style of play? We don't have any. Ten Hag is clueless as as we are, and and a lot of people feel that uh, Trevor. And you know, when I talk about style of play, as a manager, you shouldn't have one style of play. You should have a playbook with a lot of different tactics, styles coming. Like Correct. Alex Ferguson, he was a master of this. He had he had had a playbook. It was uh, like the Bible, so many pages. 
and and chapters and everything and i saw a little bit of this from uh from oli actually people called oli clueless he didn't have a style of play but oli actually had the playbook he changed up sometimes he played with the false nine he put lukaku on the right he put mata in the 10 he had so many different things and and all all we sit back with is the counter-attacking style of oli and i don't quite agree with that but uh, that's, what that's, that's another that's discussion that's why, they him, that's why they call him clueless because yeah. he was smart he didn't he didn't i mean if we come up to you craig on on saturday yeah. afternoon saturday evening and we pop three at the back five in the middle top top what do you have done you know we weren't expecting that yeah exactly Ten exactly. Hearts are going to do four three three or or four treble two as as me and Jarvis like. Mm -hmm. You know what would you have done if he'd done that? Whether we won the game or not, okay, let, that's yeah. that's clear. But if you don't take that risk or give it a go or make everyone think, Jesus, I'm not set up for that. Gee, oh, crikey, now what am I going to do? You know that's something. And Jarvis is right. You know, good footballers really good, talented, top of the game, elite professionals can play anywhere on the pitch. They really can. They can yeah. do it to a competent level, not a brilliant level, a competent level. And competency in the Premier League isn't always good enough, but sometimes it is. Sometimes it is good enough to be able to do it. So, um, yeah, great point, actually, Jarvis. And, you know, many people uh, wouldn't know, no way near would they have picked up one. So. And I think Iriola, by the way, does something similar. Because I saw you change yeah. the way that you approach the game on Saturday. Yeah, he does. And, you know, funny enough, Gary O'Neill before him used to do the same. Um, you know, when I met Gary, you know, one of the things he, you know, he spent literally about 15 minutes with us before he went back downstairs. And we was playing Brentford that Saturday. And he was studying, you know, the last three Brentford games and looking at, right, if Brentford do this, Ivan Tony does this, we do this. This is how we combat them. Yeah. And we got a nil-nil draw against them. It wasn't the greatest of games, don't get me wrong. But, you know, we nullified. We nullified that threat. And... That's what Gary O'Neill did very, very well. I know that we got rid of him, but Iriola seems to do the same as well. You know, he seems to be adapting. I think, you know, when he first came over to the Premier League, you know, I think he, he did well against Chelsea, did well against West Ham. I think the teams he struggled against was Everton. You know, he was, I think he was dumbfounded by Everton's approach at first. Um, the long ball get into the box, try and hit Calvert Lewin. Um, you know, that caused all sorts of chaos. Uh Brighton, you know, got to him. And that's why I thought, well, is he the right man? But he's adapted, he's changed his style, he's changed his style for each game. Against Crystal Palace, I looked at our team and I thought, what's this? You know, I thought, what's what what's he actually trying to do here? But it worked. It worked. And, you know, I can only explain, you know, explain by he was probably studying the Palace team, studying, right, OK, this is what Eric Beshiezi can do, you know, because Zabarnier had him in his pocket. You mm. know, there was one run through and, you know, it'll stick with me for some time, this. There was one run through that Eric Beshiezi made. Now, I really do rate him. I yeah. really do rate him. So he's made this run through, and Zabania had no divine right to get that ball. But he made that tackle. It was pinpoint perfect. And, you know, that stops a goal scoring opportunity. You know, Erebeshi, as they got into that box, we was in danger. You know, if another defender had made that tackle, you know, and say for ex I don't want to pick on him, but say for example, Chris Metham, who yeah. is a little bit more rash, you know, he's a hard working player, maybe not, you know, up to the level of the Premier League. Um, but you know, he's a hard working player, he's a valuable player as a backup. You know, if he made that tackle, you know, he'd probably have seen red. Yeah, no, I agree with that. No, no, no. You see again. A lot of, um, a, a, I have to choose my words carefully because I always get myself in trouble, don't I, Jarvis? 
Uh, but what your point there is, is it's it's not necessarily about knowledge of the game, but it's actually reading the game and understanding the game. I Me and Jarvis yeah. spend most of our time looking at what's happening rather than actually enjoying the game of football. <laughs> we tend to look what's happening, really, mainly for our Monday night show uh, that we do, because we like the, uh, the technical and the tactical uh, aspect of it. But it really is uh, very, very finite on what, could be classed as tactical and what isn't because ultimately you put 11 players versus 11 players on the same size pitch, uh, same size ball and the same size goals. So there's only a small, an area that you can, that you can deal with that, that that's it. Yeah. And very rarely will space open up unless as um, one of the lads was saying earlier, that quick turnover that mistake has made mm. when Clive was going across, if somebody comes in smashes Clive, wins the ball, we're off and we're away. We gone straight out to Rashford or straight out to Ganacho, depending on whichever, and and, and you, you're away. Attack the diagonals. Uh, your defenders are backtracking. Uh, cause it, you know, make them make a mistake. Make them make the challenge. Penalty, or I'm going to pop inside you. Bang, gone. That's how. That's how. Not that's not even technical or tactical. Let's just how speed of transition can sometimes work, but we don't. We don't do that. We don't. We doing don't. your own attributes as well. Yeah. You know, for example, Adam oh. Smith. You know, Adam Smith. I really, really, really do rate what you know. He's been yeah. a great servant to this football club. But there was questions last season. You know, whether or not he was past it. And again, there was a game against Brighton at home where he kept getting caught out by Matoma. Now, what he's done this season, what Iriola has done, is he's worked him to his advantages. So he's a little bit slower. Right, OK, stand off the player a little bit more. Make it more difficult. You know, you're not going to go and win a one-on-one -on -one battle. But, right. you know, you position yourself in the right place. Exactly. So you're going to make yourself more difficult to beat, you're going to make it more difficult for that player to get the cross into the box. You know, you've got big men like Zabarnier. You know, if it does come in, Zabarnier and Sinesi, you know, to get get it out. So that's what he does, and he does it so well. He does yeah. it so well, and he's been fantastic. You know, Max Aaron's um, a sign in from Norwich. Oh, I loved you know, him at Norwich. I did. Yeah. Loved him highly Norwich. rated. Leeds wanted him. Leeds wanted him. Yeah. We got him at the last minute. Um, you know, I really, really do rate him. But at the same time, you know, Adam Smith, you know, he's playing so well that he can't dislodge him. You know, mm. and I'm a great believer. You know, you don't just put in a player because they're younger you know, because they maybe got fresher legs or you want to bring through the young players, you have to go with what is going to win your football matches and what is, you know, as long as those players know what their attributes are, hmm. you know, and how to utilise those best, you know, I think I think he's fantastic. But, you you, know, you're more than welcome to come on our show anytime you like because you're talking mine and Jarvis's language there. Yep. Because that's what we talk about all the time. Yeah, uh, it'd be a pleasure anytime. Yeah. Anytime, oh, no, you've been brilliant, uh, guys. Yeah. Uh, would you believe uh, we've been going an hour and a half? Uh, so we minutes more. Yeah, we're 15 minutes late for questions. So, this is a time, uh, Craig, where we get uh, questions up. Uh, there may yeah. be some questions for you, or maybe not, but we yeah, will, no uh, problem. We will uh, chuck one at you. So, this is a panel question. So uh, as you're our guest, uh, you will get this uh, first. And this is from Mark Davis. I uh, hope you're still watching, Mark. Uh, if you're not, please uh, re-watch it back because your question is about to be asked. Can I ask the panel, do you think Ten Hag will be the United manager next year? Thanks, Mark. No. No, I think that uh, Sir Jim Radcliffe will make a decision. Will it be the right decision? You know, I think sometimes managers need time. Managers need time. Um, you know, Eddie Howe was unique in his way that we were on rock bottom, you know, when he took over right. and led us through the leagues. Iriola, if I had my way... You know, back after that Everton game, you know, if I was chairman, 
I probably would have said, look, Andoni, it's not working. The style's not working. But that would have been the wrong decision. That's why the football fans are fickle. However, I think Sir Jim Radcliffe will make the change. You know, will mm. it be the right one? Well, soon to be seen. Uh, I know the chap at Bologna has been linked. Um, it's a strange one, that. Very, very strange one. Um, who could Man United bring in? And who? I'd actually look at De Zerbi. I think De Zerbi would make right. sense. Yeah, there are there are people who said Deserby. Well, what do you think, uh, Jarvis? Do you think um, uh, he will be there next season or not? Mm, yeah, the, the problem is we don't know how these owners think. In a way, we just heard the, the public, the PR from uh, Sir Jim Ratcliffe, and and uh, I don't know actually, but the sensible thing would be to give Ten Hag a structure because we know he can do this. He did it with Ajax and with the structure, he functioned very well in the Ajax structure and he brought them to semi-final of the Champions League and had a great team with a lot of players. The problem now is I see he has struggled with, for example, play things that has to do with transfers and squad building. It goes to... to in-game management, as I speak a lot of, and, and how to set up the things and do tactical tweaks in a way to win the game. Because often it it, it stands on a 50-50 point and it tips one or the other way because of actions of the manager. I'm not saying the manager is, is the, the, the one and almighty mm. and can do everything, as you mentioned, Stu, for the players, but they can tip the game one side or the other by doing the right or wrong decisions. And this yeah. is where Ten Hag lacks a little bit for me. And the thing is, I haven't seen improvement of, from this season. He still do the same thing. His subs comes in late. He always predict the ball, and he doesn't change things up when needed. So, I'm not sure if he should stay as a coach. But uh, you know, I'm a little bit fifty-fifty on this. So uh, <laughs> I can't. Get a clear no, that's all right. I, I, I think he stays. That's that's my my my, my opinion. Uh, here's one for you, Jarvis. It's to me. Good to hey, have you. Hey, hey. Back with us, pal. Great to have you. Uh, do you think we need more younger, faster and stronger players with good ability on the ball and a good range of passing? Uh, good tackling to play Ten Hag style of football at Jarvis Cocker. I can't believe he didn't ask me that. <laughs> I'm only joking, it's to me. Only joking. Great question. Great question. The, the simple answer is yes. We need those type of players. Uh, I have been talking about we need ballers. I call them ballers because they we need tactical players and who's good on the ball. And I have addressed that we we need a player like Frankie de Jong who can drop down and and swivel with the ball and and be the maestro, the conductor, the guy who who sets the tempo of the game. Sometimes you slow down, sometimes you speed up, and we don't have that. We only have Bruno who always speed up, and we have players like. I don't know, McTominay, who can't do anything, basically, other than run into the box and, and, and shoot. So so <laughs> it's, it's not that easy, but we need, without a doubt, players like that in, in our team. And um, and we have a young generation coming up who, who possess those abilities. And um, if we give it a li little bit of time, hopefully we will see the 2023 generation come up and, and, and uh, thrive and bloom at this Man United team. No, absolutely. Um Craig, I'm going to give you Matthew's question. You kind of already answered it, but he's talking yep. about more of the clear outside. So do United need... Matthew, thank you very much for your question, pal. I hope you're still watching. Uh, do United need a new manager or a clear out or both? He's he's my co-host, so he better oh, be he? watching. Yeah, yeah. Watching. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, contrary to what I said before, you know... <laughs> I think, I think Sir Jim Radcliffe will make the decision, you know, with regards to, you know, getting rid of Ten Hag. Um, and I think off the back of that will be the clear out. Will it be the right decision again? I think, it, you know, like I say, I think managers need time, you know, and when you've got a, when you've got a ship as big as Manchester United, and you know, a club who 
you know, should be competing for the title, who haven't really found the person to get anywhere near replicating what Sir Alex did. It's going to take some time and it's going to take some seasons to do that. Mm. Um, you know, but by persisting with the one manager, you will get there. But that manager does need to, and you've hit the nail on the head tonight, that manager does need to be very flexible to amend his style of play, to look at, you know, the opposition. Shouldn't be going into every single game, you know, the same way because that's what's messed up Brendan Rodgers, for example. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what that's why he's so successful yeah. at Celtic because, you know, there is two teams in Scotland. Yeah, you exactly. Know, yeah, exactly. Whereas <laughs> so they both know how each other plays and, you know, that's easy enough. You know, everybody else is also runs. Whereas in the Premier League, you know, when you're managing Liverpool, yeah, you know, fair enough. The smaller teams you might get the better of still playing that way. But when you come up against Manchester United, Man City, Arsenal, Chelsea, you're going to get found out. And especially when he went to Leicester last season, that's why they sleepwalked their way to relegation because he couldn't adapt. He couldn't change it. He stuck so rigid to what worked all the time. Mm. You know, what works one moment isn't always going to work. What Iriola is doing now isn't always going to work. And what Eddie did was Eddie had to adapt, you know, because there was times, you know, there was a start. I think it was the third or fourth season. We, you know, I think it was just after, you know, the, um, you know, record finish. And we went, I think it was six, seven, eight games at the start of the season without a win. I think we got a couple of draws in there. I might be wrong. Uh, so, Matt, if you are watching, do correct me. Um, but, <laughs> you know, that season, you know, again, like I- Iriola, you thought, right, well, he-, he needs to change things, like I- Iriola did at the start of this season. So, if Ten Hag is not willing to change, it's time to get rid. Um, and, you know, no doubt the clear out will happen. Mm. There has to be a clear out of players anyway, like yeah. you say, yeah, Rashford. Absolutely. If Rashford's not pulling his weight and he's not going to pull his weight, a club like Manchester United, let's be fair, if I was given the chance to play for Manchester United, I'd work my socks off every single week. Um, It might not be my football club, but at the end of the day, I'd work my socks off every single week because you've got to be, you've got to be privileged to play for such a big club. No, I totally agree. I I, I actually think Ten Hag's uh, got two saving graces. Uh, That first one is we'll be 20 million quid in the hole. Because you're gonna to have to pay him off in his back room staff. Secondly, yeah. uh, although it looks like Nagelsmann signed to go back to Bayern Munich. I am. Um, you still got Liverpool, you still got Barcelona, potentially Real Madrid if Ancelotti hangs up his uh boots, uh potentially Juventus. All these clubs are looking for managers unprecedented. Uh I think um I don't think there's a scope to remove Ten Hag. I reckon he'll get twelve months. That's what I reckon, um, but I can I could see it either way. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> Mark's been chipping at Jarvis all night. <laughs> we love you, Mark. So Mark's um, uh, produces uh, for Jarvis Corner mm-hmm. uh, a lot. A great friend of uh, the show, brilliant, brilliant guy. Uh, he's just setting up his own channel as well. So if you get a chance, please everybody go, please like and subscribe to Mark's channel. Um, <laughs> he's been chipping a job. He's, he's a lovely guy, so you're right to reply, Mr. Cocker. <laughs> yeah, I think we talk about the goals and, and the mistake thing again. Um, how were they effective uh, when both goals came from United mistakes, Jarvis? And and I spoke about the um, Bournemouth, and, and I think they were effective in, in the way they play. They have a set style, they play simple football, but effective football, as I mentioned with Solanke. He was always behind because we attack in, in the 3 one six formation. Everybody knows this. And, and we push up really high. But Solanke was smart. He dropped down to be behind the, the top six. So he was always, always uh, open to, to be uh, playable. And, and, and this is a very smart move, you know, dropping. Because 
no center back in the right mind would, would follow Solanke that high up the pitch, especially when you're just defending with three guys. So, so Solanke, he exploited the big gap in the middle of the pitch. So, so this is effective play, I mean, from, from Brighton, no Bournemouth. And, and, and Iraola, I take my hat off from that manager. If, if, uh, if he one day become available, I would actually like to see him in, uh, in the Man United chair because I have, I have such respect for him as, as a manager and how he set up his team and, and how he get players to perform in a way. And, and he's not a flashy manager. He's not like, like the Serbi and playing the tiki taka, uh, pragmat, no, um, what do you call it? Uh, new way of style of play, but he makes things simple and effective. And that's what I like for in, in football, simple and effective football. Not too yeah. soon, Jarvis. Not too yeah, soon. Yeah, no, no, no. Not too soon. <laughs> we don't want to lose more him. <laughs> he needs more experience. But, but I, yeah. I, I really believe in him. And, and especially when you consider what he did in Spain with the, what was the team? Saragossa? Uh, no, no. Uh, Rayo Vallecano. Yeah, um, Vallecano. Vallecano. Yes, and there's yeah. a small, small club in Spain. And he took them almost to, to Europe, you know. Yes. And, and always, always uh, consistently, I think, top 10 in three seasons in a row or something like that. So that's that's really impressive from from that guy. Just before we uh, tackle Brendan's uh, question, uh, uh, Yala has just uh, made a statement. Uh, he said at the start, "There is something everyone has forgotten, which we probably have." Manchester United still under a hundred day review by Ineos. Everyone will be judged when the review is over by the end of the season. Yeah, excellent point, uh, Yala. So thank you for that. Uh, Brendan's question, very, very simple. Do we have a midfield? <laughs> I think he's made a couple of points. I haven't seen it. I think that's his... Uh... Can I give a quick answer on that? Yeah, just give a quick yeah. answer. Yeah. I think we have a midfield. Indeed, we have. But I, I will use an analogy uh, of Man United as an engine. And, and you know, we have midfielders. We have Casemiro. We have Bruno. We have Kobe Maynou. So we have a group of good midfielders and Mason Mount coming in and Ericsson. And I, I think in a way, if you use an, the analogy of an engine, you just miss the spark plug to get the engine firing. You know, it's not, if the midfield isn't working, why throw out the, the pistons and the cylinders and everything because we don't have a spark plug. Go find that spark plug and get this uh, midfield working. That's That's my analogy. And that spark plug is the six foot two inch Polinia from Fulham. It will do perfectly well. No, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll take this uh, from Pig Riser. Uh, here's a question <laughs> What the fuck has gone on with the last year this season? Um, it's very simple, uh, actually. Uh, he had this injury, required an operation, uh, elected to go back home uh, to somewhere in Holland to have the operation done. And there was complications that weren't uh, recognised until he came back to the UK. Um, ultimately, what happens when you have an injury, uh, and I made a point uh, three weeks ago about not rushing Martinez back again, and unfortunately I was proven right. Uh, your muscle memory of the opposing wow. appendage, wherever the appendage is, whether it's your arm or your leg, uh, gets a lot weaker because you're using more uh, energy and strength on that particular thing that's what was happening with Malassia they had to do some research found out that there was some bone fragments within the knee area and he's had to redo it uh, as a footballer it can take actually play havoc with your mental uh, uh, kind of stability because all you want to do is get back and you're trying and you're trying and trying and uh, unfortunately uh, it doesn't happen we're not going to see Malasia until uh, next season, and that's the right thing for the kid. Yeah, we just need to leave him alone and let him recover. But I hope that answers your question. Um, Georgie Best is in the house. Georgie Best is in the house. Um, uh, this is a question for Jarvis, but I'm actually going to give it to Craig because I yeah, think Jarvis okay. kind of touched on it as well. But Georgie Best, a friend of the show again, I hope you're still watching, Carl. Uh, Jarvis, uh, or in this case, uh, we'll put a line through that and say, Craig, uh, Rashford thrived last season. Why not this season? I think you've already touched on it, but yeah. Uh, just... Yeah. I think it's down to professionalism, um, like you you guys have said. Um, you know, I've got, you know, 
I've got so much time for him for what he did during the COVID period, but you know he seems to have lost, you know, his love for the game. See, you know that's what it feels like. Um, so you know my best option, you know, if I was Ten Hag, is if I can't get a decent way, a dis- decent figure for him to actually get get him out on loan, get him some game time, you know, somewhere else. You know, maybe uh, definitely a lower level, you know, hopefully reignite him and try and bring him back. If he's not going to respond to that or if he's not going to go on loan, he's not the right player for Manchester United. Um, So I'd probably give him a chance. um, But yeah, personally, I think his head's just dropped. And to be fair, you know, if you can't get yourself going, for a club like Manchester United, are you really a footballer? Are you really a footballer? You know, I could understand, you know, if you're at Wigan or Reading or somewhere like that who are under financial constraints that you're worrying, you know, week to week, are you going to get your wages at the end of the month? I can understand that. However, if you can't get yourself going at Manchester United, there's seriously something wrong. No, totally agree. Great answer. Thank you for that, Craig. Uh, Grace, um, I don't know if you're new to the channel or not. Uh, Jarvis? No, I haven't seen Grace, so welcome. Welcome to welcome. the club, uh, Grace. Yeah, yeah. Well, welcome, and thank you very much for the question. Um, guys, do you think if we had a director... Yeah, she became before... a new member. Oh, she did? Yes, sorry. Yeah, yes, 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 welcome, Grace. Yes, welcome. Um, director of football, when uh, Eric came in, would he be in a better situation selling players and buying the right position? If you don't mind, guys, I'll take that. Uh, Grace, your question is a superb question, and the answer to that would be yes. Years and years ago, back in the 70s and 80s and 90s, director of football, nobody would have even known what one of those is. Uh, football clubs uh, operate so differently to what they did. Uh, back in the good old days, uh, as I like to refer to. But today, uh, running a football club as a manager is is not impossible. You can't set Alex Ferguson eyes, Manchester United anymore, where he was the be-all and the end-all. Uh, Kenny Dalglish did it so successfully. Jose Mourinho's done it. So there's a list of managers that have done it. Today, you need that support from the top. Uh, they can put a good scouting network together. They can put a, a proper profile of footballers together, can talk to you and discuss with you what your plans are, what your vision is for your team. And then they can go out and they can buy the direct players around them. Absolutely. If Ten Hag and uh, the Ajax system around him at Manchester United, I think it'd be, uh, yeah, I think it'd have his feet well and truly under the table and you would see some longevity finally uh, as a manager. Yeah. Okay, uh, Evo, always good for the questions. Always good for the questions. Uh, Jarvis, for you, question. Yep. If Eric Ten Hag can't implement his own style of play. Here we go again. What makes anyone think he can implement the style, uh, the football structure uh, wants him to implement? Um, it's that's not that it's they. Yeah, the director of football doesn't want the style of play. He discusses it with the manager. And then they implement the style of play. But Jarvis, go ahead. Yeah, but I think you're right. And and people got to remember the director of football is is like the the missing link in between all departments: the manager, the the, the transfer uh, guru, and and uh, the medical department, and everything you know is put together by the director of football. And and he will try to pull all the strings to get them all working together for the best of the club and have a long time long long-term vision so i don't know if they will make ten hog change his style uh but i will help him to achieve what his style is in a yes. way so so this will be the simple answer of of uh trevor's question uh no um uh, yeah. yeah no yeah. Trevor. so Tr- trev's lucky uh that i'm putting this question up because uh he posed a second question jarvis which quite frankly <laughs> disgraceful absolute disgraceful question um in fact I'm, in fact we should ban trevor <laughs> for that question trevor yeah, yeah, I'm I'm right away. no i love you the bits trev uh 
Um, but Jarvis and uh, Craig, you can both answer that on my God. on my behalf. <laughs> and it better be that to Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, Trev. Do you know what I? Th I think this has been, you know, such a good conversation. It's it's different. It's unique to most shows that I go on. Um, actually, I did want to cover off uh, Trevor's, uh, you know, previous question. If we yeah, wait, it was for you. It was for you. Yeah, it was for you actually, uh, Craig. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I can say this from you know looking at it from a Manchester United perspective, looking at it from a Bournemouth perspective. Now, from a Bournemouth perspective, if we was to get into the Europa Conference League, it would be unbelievable. It would be amazing, you know, to go to, you know, the far end of Moldova to play some team that we've never heard of. Um, yeah, don't get me wrong. We would love a little bit of a European journey as fans. Mm. However, however, the big thing is, is at this moment in time, we haven't got the strength in depth as a football club to actually, you know, cope with that from a Bournemouth perspective. However, from a Manchester United perspective, I don't, I think you would still be able to attract good players because you are Manchester United. What I think needs to be looked at here is, you know, if, the club was to miss out on European football for a season, it might actually help, you know, model that team, build that team. Um, you know, it might not be necessarily the worst case scenario. Um, yeah, it is going to be lost revenue. But, you know, what would you prefer? You know, missing out on the Europa League one year or, you know, the following season, you know, getting to second in the league you know back in the champions league you know i'm sure that would be a preference over you know a little bit of a european journey you know to actually have a side which is capable of fighting for the title yeah t t totally agree totally agree great uh, great answer trev uh i hope that answers your question swine and uh, uh, look forward to seeing you next time. But before we could do any further, our good old mate Big Riser has popped in with five memberships. Absolutely superb, mate. Thank you so much. You get the Lennon glasses, pal. You get the Lennon glasses. Craig, next time you come on, you're going to have to have something, you know, like a neon. Oh, uh, yeah. I'll have to find some. Something. You're going to have to find something, pal. Yeah. I do actually have, you know, a pair of, well, these are kind of, you know, I normally wear contacts, but yeah. Yeah, there's get the them on. Harry, there's well, the old Harry Potter glasses. Harry Potter there. glasses, get them on. Get them on. <laughs> we have five, five new members. Relax, Jill, Andreas Rasmussen, I think he's Danish, Edward Reed, welcome back to the club, Edward, and uh, Ashid uh, Miha, and uh, Jimmy Milligan, welcome to the club. Welcome all. Welcome. Remember to thank Pig Riser. Jarvis, are you going to put Trevor straight then, please, before we move on? Yeah, first of all, Stu is not a member. He's a co-host. Yes, thank you. Yeah, there you go. So I am yeah. valuable. Yeah, <laughs> and, you know, Stu, Stu is fantastic. I like his, uh, his uh, view on football. And uh, he's a great lad. So uh, Stu is always welcome and a part of Jarvis's corner. Yeah, so you. And the mighty Tipton Town. And mighty Tipton Town. <laughs> uh, Jarvis, question for you from yep. um, Rutinator. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Rutinator, big up. Yes, thank you. I hope you're still watching. Um, no Champions League, 50 million quid loss. Uh, no Europe uh, or no Europe at all, 25 million minimum loss. So Gary Tenard, 15 million, which is a point that I actually made. I think 20 million with his backroom stuff. Where's the money coming from for recruitment this summer? Um, <laughs> I think I think uh, he's talking about Sir Jim as well. Um, I'll just briefly touch on that. Actually, um, we we necessarily don't have to worry about money at Manchester United because our generational income is on the rise. And as of next year, uh, Vuganator, uh, we have ninety five million a season with uh, Adidas. 
I think it starts next year, doesn't it, Jarvis, or the year after? Yeah. And we've got a nice deal with Snapdragon uh, on the front of our shirts. So the money, um, what why Manchester United is so attractive is we are self-generating, almost like the self-generating city. No, no, we can't say that, can we? Because they didn't self-generate anything. Um, but we are self-generating. Uh, there will be money available. What you tend to happen, uh, because Manchester United runs a business, um, this next year's transfer budget would have been offset in this season's uh, figures. So you kind of save it up uh, throughout the uh, throughout the year. That's how you that's how you do it. Jarvis, anything to add? No, I think you 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 were spot on. And, and the only thing I can add is I think they're changing up the rules a little bit so the depth wouldn't be as much uh, important. Uh, it's more about the revenue. So I think we will have money. But the thing is, uh, we have to spend our money wisely. That's 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 brilliant and try to buy Mbappe. You know that that will be silly. We oh. have to be smart. M- Mbappe, you yeah. who's he? Never heard of him. <laughs> Like, he's out shaking uh, world leaders' hands, isn't he, Mbappe? Uh, that's what I saw. Anyway, um, two questions left. We've actually got one for Craig uh, as well, but we will leave that to the final question uh, as our uh, brilliant guest. So thank you very much for coming on, Craig. So, no Jarvis, just a very quick one here. Yep. <laughs> Zerby ball with his place. <laughs> Sounds like a horror show. Tend to agree. <laughs> Yeah, but the thing is with the Serbi, he's a, he's a he's a coach more than a manager. He he goes on the pitch in training suits and and uh, and football boots every day with the players and train and coach them. And this is people talk about Ten Hag. He's not a coach, and this is why people like the Serbi more because he has the on-field coaching and and. I can see a positive with this Serbi. The thing is, his, his style is too ex- uh, expansive in a way with, with this group of players. I don't think it will work, uh, but he's a great manager. And, and if we will do great in the transfer window and, and get rid of uh, all the usual suspects, you know, who I speak about, then maybe the Serbi could, be, could come good. I completely agree with your analysis on that. I think you're right. I think Deserbi is a coach. Uh, he's got his track suit on and he, he goes in there with his pegs and um, he, he, he tries to influence uh, what Brighton do. So, mm. yeah, I tend to agree with you. Just before we do the final question, the gaffer has uh, teed me up. He said, uh, Stu, when are we going to see you in the pink top again? I can pull that out for you next uh, next Monday, no problem at all. And do I have pink boots? <laughs> there's only uh, there's only two pairs of boots you'll ever see in my bag, and those are Copa Mondiales and World Cups, the greatest boots ever. There is no more discussion to be had. Oh, unless you want to talk about Puma Kings or Nike Tiempos, but those are the greatest and grandest football boots ever. Love them, love them to bits. Fit like a glove. Um, <laughs> To on that in my bag, I always had a pair of flip flops too. After oh, I've got flippers. yeah, I've got flippers and sliders, yeah, yeah. Uh, four pairs of boots. Um, because you never you, you never know. Um, but, but I've always got two world cups, two, two copers. I've had to change my world cups and my copers, one pair after uh, 20 years for both. So I've had to just change those. Uh, football socks, knee supports. Um, uh, I could go on, Rip socks. Well, I've got a pair of Lucky Shreddies as well. Uh, back in 1996, Budweiser were giving away free pants. If you bought a bottle of Budweiser with 96 on the back, they look like uh, Shreddies, mm-hmm. like um, Y-fronts, and I wear those. I've had them since 96. <laughs> they've got, they've got, they're literally disintegrating, but I wear those. Uh, I shouldn't really tell you this, guys, but they're my Lucky, my lucky Shreddies. So... Uh, we should do some of watching your football back because my football, my missus laughs at me. So every Friday night at seven o'clock, she goes, what are you doing? I get me bag. Of so she goes, it's football. <laughs> Hold on. If I, if I go without something and I can't find it, I start panicking. So mm. you got to do that. Craig, uh, our brilliant guest, uh, you do have a question, which is, I'm, I'm really pleased. I take it, do you know Gary, do you? Or? Um... I don't know. Well, thank you for your question, Gary. Um, it, we, if we is Gary new to the channel? Um, no, 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 Gary is a is a legend Gary, of the channel. So uh, yeah, he's one of the regulars. Gary, welcome. I hope you're still watching. Uh, Craig, 
Has expectation yeah. amongst Cherry's fans gone up since Iriola came in? Challenge for a Europa, uh, Europa League spot. Good question. Yes, yeah, it is a good question. Um, I actually spoke to Jim White, uh, Simon Jordan and Stuart Pearce with regards to this um, a little while back when Irio before the start of the season. And, you know, Bill Foley was also on there just before me. And Bill Foley said, look, we, you know, we want to go places. We want to build this team. We want to, but we don't want to do it all overnight. So the expectation from the fan base, you know, is a lot, lot higher than it was un- with G- under Gary O'Neill. Um, I think Gary O'Neill got a little bit of a hard end of the stick, to be honest, because the thing is, he, he kept us up. You know, he did well. You know, I was impressed with what he brought yeah. to the table. Yeah. But I think Iriola it's now shown that it was justified, you know, changing the manager and Iriola has been fantastic. Um, you know, at first it took him a little while to get going, but yeah, he's, he's got there. Europe, like I say, I think it would be bad at this point in time because I think we would have to break PSR rules to actually get to that stage with the right sort of players. But there's no reason in three years' time why we can't be ready for Europe. Um, you know, hopefully at that point we'll already be building a new stadium. Um, of course, stadium costs, like with the Everton situation, don't come into PSR. So, Correct. you know, yeah. we won't be hit for that. Um, but I think we need to do things sustainably. We need to build brick by brick rather than going all out and just spending a load of money and then failing because we've seen so many teams do that. Um, spend, Everton is the biggest one. Everton being beaten 6-0 tonight, um, you know, they're, they're the big one. You know, the, they went out, they went, you know, let's be honest, Farhad Mashiri or if you read into it a little bit more, it was more Usmanov's money, of course, War in the Ukraine breaks out, they come a cropper because of PSR, um, because most of the money isn't being put in for, by Farhad Mashiri. This is what I've read. And yeah, personally, you know, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. So yeah, we need to we need to be careful. And yeah, thank you, Trevor. No, I appreciate it, mate. So Wait, don't suck up to Trev. Oi. Yeah, <laughs> you, were doing all right. you were doing all right. You know, but yeah. Oh, Trevor, Trev, you're more than welcome to come and have a look at up the cherries and all departments. Come and say hello to us for it every now and again. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> guys. Um, we've we've done almost two hours ten minutes. It's been an absolute uh, wonderful show. I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope you guys and the definitely our room have enjoyed it the questions have been absolutely top draw as always uh we will get craig back on uh actually yes. just to talk football with us it doesn't have to be about ball yeah. just come to talk football with us um yeah, definitely and if you, want a, if you want a couple of experts on your channel at any time then trevor's always free <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> honestly definitely you're more than welcome you're more than welcome uh, just, on us the and all department. yeah just, just just reach out to us uh yeah. the guys there's been some uh, football boots come in. Uh, Mark's absolutely right about Deodora. Deodora, when I was growing up, were absolutely superb. Yeah, and he had some uh, superb um, players like Roberto Baggio, uh, Donna Doni were playing uh, in uh, Deodora boots. New Balance, uh, Robson Pros back in the day. Um, yeah, I could list football boots for years, yeah, absolutely years. But so, uh, Jarvis, uh, I will hand it over to you to say thanks to everybody and um, yeah. Yeah, thanks again, everyone in the VR room. You've been superb. I, I just want to say, say uh, first of all, um, we talked a little bit about Rashford and, and what's gone wrong with with Rashford. And um, today, Mick Ruby released a, a mini documentary about Rashford. It's called What's Gone Wrong. I just want to show you a snippet from this. And um, Afterwards, I want you all to go to uh, key, stay on this channel and, and watch this documentary. Um, ...were raised when the forward was spotted partying in Belfast, Northern Ireland, 
around the same time. A waitress who was a key witness in this incident came forward and told the news that Rashford went on a 12-hour tequila drinking spree while in Belfast. And that's that. It's just like a teaser for you guys. Go on, watch that. It's yeah, about 15 minutes that. long and it's perfectly edited from uh, Mick Ruby. So uh, stay on MUFC Realist TV. And at the end of the show, big up to Craig for uh, coming on, staying on for yeah. uh, two hours, 10 minutes. My pleasure. Rory, as always. Pleasure. And uh, all the people in the chat, uh, Trevor Wade, Mark, Evil Bosses, the Wootinator, Pig Riser, Gary C. Uh, who else do we have here? Lucky Singh with all his uh, comments. Stephanie, Evil Bobby, Stephanie, Stephanie Griffiths, Bennett. Mark Davis, Stephanie Griffith. So many of you and for all the gifted memberships. Uh, thank you for, uh, for those. And we will be back next Monday, 9 p.m. As always, Jarvis's Corner. And uh, see you on the next. Thank you so much for stopping by and watching MUFC Realist TV. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow us on the socials. Realist TV.